The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening and welcome to this evening's webinar. Hello, I'm Mark Jones and I'll be part facilitator and part presenter for tonight's talk. Uh, if you want any basis points, um, feel free just to put your, your name and details into the questions tab and uh, AHDB will um, contact you regarding that. Uh, we also have Katie Forley from AHDB uh, who will be in the background uh, making sure everything is, is running smoothly for tonight. Um, as I've just mentioned with the basis points, there is a questions tab and button on your right hand side. So feel free at any time to put your questions in there throughout tonight. Hopefully the webinar will last about 35 to 40 minutes and then we will take questions afterwards. Um, as we mentioned, there is a series of these are a series of webinars which have been jointly sponsored uh, by AHDB, Field Options, Momont, and KWS. Uh, field Options are a grass and forage seed specialist and have been developing beet grazing systems in the UK for nearly 17 years. And they currently have uh, four grazing varieties. Momont is based in northeast France and the breed is a dual purpose fodder beet. And finally, KWS are major are a major breeder of sugar and fodder beet in Europe and are aiming to improve crop establishment through high-tech seed production. So tonight uh, we'll be talking about uh, the agronomy of grazed fodder beets, looking at maximizing leaf and root yield. Again this is the final one in the series so if you uh, wanted to go back and catch up um, on the internet uh, we had the first one was transition of cattle and sheep the second was beef, the third dairy, and the fourth sheep. So feel free to go back and, and have a look at those. Uh, this series is also running with Farm Connecting Wales over the next uh, two weeks as well. So in terms of uh, speakers for tonight, so tonight uh, it's going to be mostly uh, re-sowing from field options. So Reese specialises in the agronomy of grassland, forage crops and fodder beet and is basis and facts qualified. Uh, this is myself, Mark Jones, so I'm an independent grass and forage consultant. I also farm out winter 350 dairy beef um, on fodder beet and uh, also about 600 sheep and we've been doing that for the last five or six years. And finally we have Dr Jim Gibbs. So Jim is uh, a research scientist in ruminant nutrition at Lincoln University in New Zealand. He's also a trained veterinarian and over the last 10 years much of his research has concentrated on fodder beet and he's been the main driver to increase uh, the acreage or hectareage uh, grazed beet from 10 hectares to 70,000 hectares over this period. So just to get things going I'd like to now pass over to Rhys Owen and uh, get tonight's webinar started. Over to you Rhys. Thank you Mark and good evening everybody. Um, so we're going to basically cover uh, the agronomy of, of grazed fodder beet and where that, and highlight the differences where that might differentiate itself from uh, from usual beet agronomy. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. Uh, and again. So as, as an overview, we're going to look at establishment and drilling, crop nutrition, weed control, pest control and disease control. Uh, we'll briefly hand over to Jim Gibbs, who's going to talk about uh, recent innovations in grazing beet management and uh, developments in, in New Zealand. And then we'll move over onto the uh, question and, and answer session. Next slide, please, Mark. So fodder beet requires a soil which is high in pH, a pH of 6.5 to 8 with good P and K levels. Ideally a medium to light free draining soil uh, to allow, obviously to allow for early field work in the spring, but also to uh, facilitate grazing and high utilisation of that crop grown in the winter. 
when it comes to seedbed requirements, a fine and firm level seedbed is required, worked to about 50 to 70 millimetres in depth, with a, with a very fine structure. Um, aggregate size would be sort of three three mil or less in that in that area of the seedbed, with an open stru structure below that to allow for for early root development. Um, at all points during cultivations, uh, moisture should be conserved um, to stop that, that seed bed drying out. And a cloddy seed bed will, will lead to, to issues later on. In terms of grazing, we need to think grazing from the very start. And that we should consider the direction of, of drilling within the field. Uh, previous webinars have mentioned transitioning and, and access of, of stock onto, onto fodder beet. Uh, all all those all those issues need to be thought about early on and and planned ahead. In terms of environmental considerations, we really should be avoiding any steep slopes or banks uh, where soil runoff or soil erosion could could be an issue in in winter during during rainfall. Uh, we could also think about leaving leaving headlands unsown to to allow for easier transition of cattle or even as well to, to buffer buffer that soil runoff effect. Uh, any any sloping fields with with water courses should be uh, should be disregarded completely. Next slide please Mark. So in terms of starting drilling, you shouldn't start drilling really. Ideally soil temperatures should be seven to eight degrees and rising. The variety drill should be the right variety for grazing. Uh, we've mentioned pre in previous webinars that we need a, a high percentage of roots out of the ground to get that utilization rate, utilization rate, but all importantly, the palatability of that variety. It should also be quality seed as well, with high germination, vigor, and uh, purity. The beta are drilled with precision drills, and they require good seed beds to work in. And seeds are generally placed into moisture at depths of 20 to 35 mil, and ensuring a good seed to soil contact for, for a rapid establishment. Seed rates there, as mentioned, seed rates, sort of 100 to 124,000 seeds per hectare. The lower rate would be more suitable for grazing with, with sheep on fodder beet systems. Uh, that lower, lower seed rate gives more, more room for each plant, and it just manipulates the amount of roots that's, uh, that's above ground. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. So recent developments in seed technology have allowed for a promotion in early plant development. And the key to, to fodder beet agronomy and management is to ensure that we get from germination and emergence to canopy closure as quickly as possible. It's during those key summer months of May, June, July onwards that uh, the fodder beet canopy is able to intercept as much light as possible and uh, transfer that into into yield so the technology available through seed priming has enabled us for to achieve a faster germination more even establishment and that's been very useful in managing herbicide inputs if you've got an even crop i think you know after the identical growth stage all the way through, it's it, it's a lot easier to manage. That early leaf development, as we said, capturing more sunlight, but also that early root development has been key to get the roots down, exploring the soil profile, accessing nutrients and um, to a deeper depth before any particular dry period that may, that may be oncoming. Next slide, Mark. So field scale trials, have always consistently shown a benefit of that priming process. Next slide. Fodder beet is a high yielding crop with a very high nutrient demand and responds well to fertility. Crop nutrition and yield relies on several different nutrients and factors all of them must be adequately provided in, in order to achieve optimum yields. A three-year study in the UK found that 
a 20 ton dry matter per hectare crop of fodder beet, its uptake in nutrients was 250 kilos per hectare for nitrogen, 90 kilos for phosphate, and 580 kilos for potash. So it is all important that soil testing and detailed analysis is done beforehand to ensure that the crop has its optimum amount of nutrients. Different to other crops, so uh, fodder beet has a requirement for sodium. As it drives from wild seed beet, it can, it can partly replace its potash requirements with salt. And there's always, always a yield benefit from applying both, um, especially on, on lower K soils. And most, most UK soils will benefit from that application of salt when growing beet. Where sodium is below 25 milligrams per litre, uh, we recommend 200, 200 kilos per hectare of sodium, and that equates to 400 kilograms per hectare of agricultural salt, which would be applied early, and not on the seed bed, as high rates of sodium and potash together can cause seed damage. Other considerations when it comes to nutrients is the antagonistic effect that or the interactions that nutrients have on each other. We've already mentioned the high potash applications and high potash applications can reduce the availability of magnesium. So it's also important to test for magnesium, but also I'd recommend leaf analysis in the growing crop to assess for nutrients at all times to uh, reduce any, any deficiencies. Uh, onto the trace elements. Boron, uh, the fodder beet is, is quite susceptible to boron deficiency. And um, that is to do a lot with the soil types that, that we grow fodder beet on. Those lighter soils that don't receive much organic manures, they tend to be lower in boron. Or soils with a high pH above eight and the, uh, the boron availability is reduced. But also where high nitrogen rates are used, that will have a negative effect on boron availability. So boron should be considered and applied into the fertilizer program. Manganese, manganese is another nutrient that's uh, vital for, for healthy foliage growth and healthy, healthy development of, of the leaf canopy. And that also is at risk of deficiency or less availability in, in high pH soils uh, and light soils or where, where we have a cold and wet period. Next slide, Mark. As it's a spring sown crop, uh, fodder beet lends itself well to, uh, to the utilisation of organic manures. Organic manures can be used to, uh, to, fully, so, to fully, fully meet some of the P and, and K requirements for the crop. And if poultry manures are available, then they can also, they can also contribute a fit, fair amount of, of the nitrogen that the crop requires. Uh, it's really important not to damage any, any soils uh, when applying manure, so it must be done in, in the right conditions. Uh, fodder beet hates, hates compaction. It needs to be incorporated well, and it needs to be uh, fully accounted for in the, uh, in the nutrient planning. Um, but I would also recommend that available nutrients in the form of P and K and nitrogen as well are applied to the seed bed as as, as crop available then uh, to drive that early growth before before the roots reach down onto, onto the farmyard manure or any other manure used. Next slide, please, Mark. Traditional fodder beet fertilizer recommendations have, derived, have been derived from, from sugar beet growing in the UK. Uh, in sugar beet growing, nitrogen in the roots is, is, is often penalized for, and it's not needed. Therefore, from, from the figures that I mentioned earlier, from the three-year study, you'll notice that the nitrogen rates there are considerably lower, uh, often half of, uh, of what, what crop, top, crop uptake is. Uh, there is no N max for fodder beet, um, so we can we can increase increase that nitrogen rate. Uh, 
and I think for grazing crops it's it's the nitrogen rate and timing that's uh, made all the difference in improving yields the yields of both the top and the root uh, but also the retention of that top and healthy leaf going into winter when it's when it's needed for grazing uh, it's also important to to account for the return of manures on on grazed fodder beet crops um, as the, as the majority of them, the, the nutrients there are, uh, are put back into into the soil through uh, through animal deposition so take account of them in in falling crops next slide mark so in terms of the timing of nitrogen and possibly potash and the changes that we can see the traditional sugar beet or beet agronomy if you'd like um it would be an application of 45 kilograms of of n in the seed bed after drilling and then followed by by the balance of that requirement um mostly deducting what uh, what organic manures would would contribute uh, once once the rows are, are up and established now the nitrogen and potash timings for grazed beet we are not only applying more nitrogen but we're applying it to the crop later as well and that's having two two major effects on developing that yield and increasing the yield of the top and the root but it's also increasing the protein content of the root and the top and i know this is is something that that jim will will discuss later and it's also re helping us retain that top into the winter months next slide please mark Beet is very susceptible to competition from weeds, and it's important to know previous field history. Uh, we'd aim to start clean and then keep the crop clean until canopy closure. Um, taller weeds that grow above the canopy can significantly compete with the crop for light. And we can see there that the yield loss is occurring from, from those generally small weed populations. Perennial weeds, uh, they need control in, in, in previous cropping, especially in a, in a grassland rotation. Um, weeds like you know, creeping, creeping thistle, they need to be controlled well previously. Um, and they can, you know, if, if they're an issue in the, in the fodder beet crop, they can, they can add cost um, into, the, into the herbicide program. So most sugar beet chemistry is available fodder beet but not all not all are approved for use on fodder beet so a programmed approach is is important we're also dealing with less actives which puts more of an emphasis on pre-emergence timings uh, and and post post m applications as well and um, we've we've lost desmedifam as a, as a key post-emergence active and we've lost chlorid chloridazone as a as a pre-emergence uh, so a programmed approach and if you can move on to the next slide please mark so pre-planting pre that could be uh, a break crop uh, which, which would give us more opportunities to control weed there uh, total weed control with glyphosate and even if, if the ground can be worked early enough uh, there'd be there'd possibly be an opportunity there for a, for a stale seed bed so that we'd actually produce a, a seed bed and stimulate those those weeds to, to germinate and, and we can control those first few flushes of weeds reducing the amount of weeds that, uh, that germinate within the crop. Uh, the use of a pre-emergence um, some people decide to to use others others not um, the main factor for for the use of a, of a pre-emergence and it's success factor really is, is a good seed bed a good seed bed and, and moisture in the seed bed um, it won't, won't control everything but anything that does get through that uh, pre-emergence application it will be sensitized for for post-emergence herbicides uh, always follow up with contact and residual and it's important that weeds don't get past that one to two true leaves timing at the latest um, so we'd be looking really to follow up treatments 
ranging on on the approach taken it would be between seven and 14 days um, and always use rates that are appropriate to the stage of the crop and the weeds uh, next slide please mark so what are my key key successes to to weed control they obviously need management so you need to work with with an experienced agronomist and the sprayer and a good sprayer operator as well it's all all down to timeliness but also hygiene uh, fodder beet is very sensitive to uh, to non beet herbicides so um, we don't want any any potential residues of anything else going onto that crop getting the seed bed quality right that will get the crop off to the best start but it will also ensure that you have the best efficacy from uh, from from your residual chemistry and the early nutrition to push on that crop get get the crop moving as quickly as possible uh, to, to compete with weeds and, and close that canopy uh, there are other options available interrow cultivators um, they can be used but they do please do remember that they will move the soil so that will that will inactivate the uh, the residual layer but they're probably more used in in organic systems um, as are burners but it is more of a more of a specialist specialist niche sector really but uh, there is a, quite a bit of organic beets grown in the uk next slide so we move on to pest and disease control and um, we're not going to cover everything here this evening we're just going to sort of highlight highlight some key changes um with changes in in seed treatment options um a couple of years ago mean that we no longer have activity or, or protection against certain pests or uh, disease vectors we can move on to the next slide please mark so if we're beets in a, in a grassland rotation and then that's that's a wire worm uh, the seed treatment force has has activity um, but it's probably best really that, that we control or avoid wire worm where, where we can and, and that would be through through crop rotation um, it's a pest that can can lead to to a loss of plants early on eating through the, the roots and the shoots uh, if, we, if we do have to follow grass then ensuring that sowing conditions and that early nutrition is uh, is adequate and, and gets the crop off to the best start next slide please mark leather jackets um they're another one associated with with grassland um the crane fly lays its eggs on 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 grassy fields during uh, during august and, and september uh, no longer any chemical control for for leather jackets um, previously we would have we would have had chlorpyrifos for use and uh, it would have been controlled there so really the two options that we've got is either to put in a break crop in the previous season so it breaks that life cycle um, but we can also sort of manage the amount of eggs laid by grazing that by grazing management so if you graze that field tightly in august and september uh, we, we, we can reduce the amount of eggs laid it's also important to note that 50 percent of of leather jackets the population in the soil would would be controlled by cultivations uh, rolling will also limit their movement in the soil and early plowing where where suitable um, is, is an option as well where where the ground is plowed to two months before before drilling or, or establishment so we are effectively you reduce start starving the leather jackets next slide please uh, just a want to highlight the need for a, for a healthy rotation when it comes to beet growing uh, beet cyst nematodes uh, build up over time in the soil and the uh, female put, creates cysts on, on the root hairs and then this then sort of creates a, a bearding effect on the root um, and the roots roots don't develop properly uh, they can't access nutrients and it can 
can sort of uh, reduce yield by by sixty percent in worst case scenario. But it is more more prevalent in in traditional beet growing areas. Um, we'd rec always recommend a, a one in four rotation for, for fodder beets, or even even a one in five would be would be optimum. Next slide, please, Mark. Okay, so the this is the the big topical one this year, really the the virus yellows and its vector or vectors, and the main vector is the peach potato aphid. But previously, the neonicotinoid seed treatments would have given us approximately eight to ten weeks protection, and it's those early infections where where the where the aphids come into the crop, uh, feed and infect the crop. Um, that, that, that's where the yield losses occur, occur from. Um, so we now need to uh, monitor the crops very, very closely, uh, and the treat with appropriate aphicides uh, when when thresholds are met. Um, the thresholds for aphid numbers are one per four plants, or one wingless green aphid per four plants, and that that would trigger and justify justify that aphicide application. Once the plants get to 12 leaves, they, they reach a mature stage where they are more resistant or tolerant to the virus. And um, so you, you, can, you can well see that, that early promotion of good, healthy growth and optimum conditions for, for rapid growth uh, play, play a part to, uh, to help that. Uh, something else to think about is, is on, the, on the nutrition side is, is potash, um, adequate potash or crops that are not deficient in potash. Uh, they, 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 they can build stronger, more resilient leaf. Um, and it's been shown in, in other crops that they are less susceptible to, to aphid feeding and, and less susceptible to, uh, to you know, virus transmitted by, by that feeding. So if we move on to the next pest, which is the flea beetle. And I've put that in there really to a bit associated really with, with the previous slide. And um, flea beetles, they're another growing problem. And we wouldn't no longer have have that protection from the seed treatments. But I think it's important to highlight that their control really needs to be justified. Um, if they attack the crop early, um, when it's only got its cotyledons, or even you know just a few leaves, um, and, that, and it leads to plant loss, then yes, the treatment is justified. But if we're using a pyrethroid on a, on a fodder beet crop to to treat for sort of you know not significant flea beetle damage, then that is only selecting for resistance in the aphids and between 80 and 90 percent of, of the aphid the peach potato aphid population is now resistant to parathroids so we'd be selecting there for, for the resistant aphids um, but we'd also be taking we would be killing and controlling the beneficial aphid predators and so it needs bearing in mind there of uh, integrated pest management really um, you know, your fodder beet in the in the right conditions, you should be able to grow away from from low level damage from flea beetle. Next slide, please, Mark. And this is the other key area, really, where where the agronomy of of, of fodder beet for for grazing has 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 really developed. Um, foliar diseases need need controlling to keep that green leaf area for building yield in the autumn um, but also these, we need to provide that good healthy leaf for the grazing livestock so the main main diseases that we see really are powdery mildew we see them sort of july to autumn uh, rust uh, that's in damp conditions uh, 15 to 22 degrees Celsius and uh, in that mid August to September period. Um, Ramularia, the angular leaf spots that we see later on, and they, they, they coalesce and we lose the leaf area. So it's important that that leaf area is, is protected uh, once, once we see the first signs of disease. 
uh, and I would recommend following up afterwards with a with a second application uh, sort of four weeks later just to maintain that healthy leaf going into winter so over to Jim to share his his knowledge and information on how beta agronomy has evolved and uh, continues to do so in New Zealand Uh, thank you very much, Rhys, and good evening to the uh, UK audience this evening. Um, excellent presentation, and I don't intend to speak very long and uh, bring forward some of the really simple things that have changed in New Zealand. <clears throat> As a background to that, uh, the agronomy that we inherited in New Zealand was very much UK sugar beet agronomy, and uh, out of interest, there was some earlier work looking at biofuels in New Zealand in the late 80s. And then again in Australia in the sort of 90s and 2000s in several different areas and across a lot of the UK today. And it's very interesting to note that the yields were completely consistent in that bracket. So in the high teens, uh, stretching into the early 20s and never very much further. And for the first few years in the last 10 years or so of New Zealand's rise of fodder beet, those yields were maintained. They were pretty much identical to that. And there really wasn't very much thought given to uh, any changes. And if I was jump forward to today, uh, it's a very large shift. And it's, uh, it's really common today to have yields that are well over 30 tonnes of dry matter. Our highest yields in the better areas are in the mid 40 tonnes of dry matter. And it's not uncommon for a lot of experienced operators to consistently bat 30 tonnes of dry matter or above year after year after year. And there's been a couple of things that have been uh, uh, behind that uh, change. But if there was two of them, it would be a change in the fertiliser process and also the seed number. And probably in recent years, they've come together because to some extent, they're both linked. So getting back to something that Reese has already gone over earlier, which is worth reiterating, grazing beet has a different key performance indicator than sugar beet. Um, it, it's really important, and those of you who've uh, listened to the previous uh, webinars would have understood very well that our whole approach to grazing beet as a primary component of the diet is to balance uh, energy and protein. And the only way that that can be done is by strip grazing, and more importantly, by having an agronomically well husbanded crop. That means we've got a quite strong proportion of the total dry matter of the plant as leaf and also that we hold really good leaf, that high proportion of leaf into the colder seasons. And the way that we've done that in short is by altering the nitrogen inputs to a lesser extent, some of the other inputs, particularly potash, but it's, it's the nitrogen inputs that have increased the proportion of leaf that we have and also increased the crude protein both in the leaf and in the bulb. And that high crude protein uh, and good quality leaf in mid-autumn to late autumn in particular is what holds that good quality leaf well into the winter. And we require that if we want optimum grazing systems. So the shift in that for us has been to increase the nitrogen per hectare in the total season, but also to split the applications of that nitrogen and have at least three and four applications of nitrogen. And the last two of them, at least for the UK audience and your experience, would be a lot later than you normally experience. So uh, to flip the seasons over between the northern and uh, southern hemispheres, the, uh, the last of these nitrogen applications are going on in mid or sometimes late October, if you were to put that in a New Zealand context. So uh, as Reese pointed out before, there was a, a very large amount of research done specifically on nitrogen uh, by British sugar and also by various Europeans, particularly the Germans, and Christa Hoffman as example for many years and what they demonstrated was that the sucrose per hectare which of course is the key performance indicator for sugar beet growth and production <clears throat> was maximized when the nitrogen per hectare was number one relatively low certainly under 200 kilograms a hectare and number two put on quite early in the phase later nitrogen was and more nitrogen was demonstrated to increase the nitrogen content of the bulb which is a negative and you grade it against in uh, sugar beet production, but also to uh, increase the proportion of leaf and the nitrogen of the leaf. So looking back through some of that literature there, it's, it's all in that literature if you're looking for it. 
And in New Zealand in recent years, that's precisely what we did. As a way of driving uh, higher leaf content, we were using nitrogen levels that were uh, increasing each year. So for quite a while, we were on 200 kilograms of nitrogen a year for a lot of the crops. Now for the very large crops today, it'd be really common to have 300 kilograms of nitrogen a year, more or less split into four equal applications of nitrogen with the last two occurring from um, mid to late summer and into mid autumn. Now the second component about that would be that uh, if, and Risa touched on this, that B takes up, it's a very large dry matter yield, so therefore it takes up quite a lot of potassium. And it, it is interesting that in some of the soils that could be considered to be reasonable in terms of potassium, one of the sticky points for the high beet yields is that the peak time that that dry matter is being laid down is in late autumn, uh, sorry, late summer and uh, early autumn. As a consequence, in some cases, the per day dry matter accumulation can be 250 kilograms and above of dry matter, that is. So there's an extraordinary demand on potassium at that point to drive that growth. Uh, as a consequence of that, in the split applications of nitrogen, it's really common routine to also apply uh, potash. And the con particularly in that late summer and early autumn period, and the concept behind that is to fuel with a very available source of um, potassium, that extraordinary growth over that period. Um, I'll add one thing there for the UK audience, something that we get asked all the time is uh, how are we apply that nitrogen? Is it as a foliar nitrogen or is it as a prill? And in most cases it's urea, simply urea, and it's put on as a hard furt and we don't uh, concern ourselves with the fact that some goes into the leaves. I know that's a uh, concern in the UK. It's not something that we worry about. Uh, bulk furt application of solid furt at beyond canopy closure is really common. And uh, we've had great results with that for a number of years now. And the final thing that I'll say is to talk about uh, row spacing and seed number. Um, it's an interesting point that uh, row spacing in sugar beet crops was never done to maximize the yield of sugar or to maximize the yield of dry matter. Uh, row spacing was done to enable harvesting. And as a, cons as a consequence of that, we inherited that sugar beet agronomy when we've moved into grazing systems. There's no strong reason for the rows to be at 500 mil in a grazing system. The practical reality though, is that all of the drills were built to follow the harvesters in, in that sort of process. And as a consequence, it was very difficult to get drills that were less than 450 mils. Some of the recent drills by accident have been a bit narrow and we can get down to 375 mils now. And really the narrow row width is um, taking over in New Zealand. Uh, if you maintain the same intra row seed spacing and you pull the rows in from 375, then from a, a typical 90 or 100,000 seed per hectare sowing rate, which would be very common at 500 mils in New Zealand uh, traditionally, you can increase without any difficulty at all up to 110 or 115,000 seeds. And pretty much the yield follows that increase up. As we've got narrower rows and we've increased the seed uh, po population per hectare, the yield has followed without too much drama that seed number uh, almost uh, on a linear line. So if we can increase the seed, the viable seed count by 30%, um, we've also increased the yields by about 30%. And that really was a driver for us to move from the uh, early 30s up into the mid 40s in terms of maximum tonnages that we're achieving these days. And um, there's a couple of other effects of that increased seed population and narrow rows. I mean, the first effect is that uh, Reese has pointed out before that the uh, importance of weed control and the best weed control is early canopy closure. The quicker that you can achieve canopy closure and smother out competition, um, the better it is. It's cheaper, there's less herbicide applications and typically a better result. So there's some other knock-on effects of having these uh, row spaces changed. And I believe that you'll see more and more of that in the UK in the next few years. Certainly, it is almost completely taken over in the New Zealand environment now. And with those uh, points, I'll give it back to Reese to, for the remainder of the uh, presentation and the questions. Thank you, Jim. So just to summarise up really um, my key key points for 
for success is to plan ahead and that includes you know the soil soil analysis detailed soil analysis working with the right people that's the work with a good agronomist work with a good drilling contractor uh, and sprayer operator as well um, never never wander far from thinking about grazing the crop right from the start and that nutrition as as jim's just sort of re-highlighted really has, has been key to uh pushing pushing yields and uh, quality of of the fodder beet and that is you know maximizing that root and top yield and, and protecting it with the fungicide um and that additional nitrogen as well before before going into winter and anybody who's who's considering growing beet i think always always recommend talk to those that are, who are already doing it and, and and grazing beets successfully thank you very much we we'll move on to uh, move on to questions okay thank uh, thank you very much Reese and, and jim so i thought um i'll just kick it off with the first question which is how early can i drill and what benefits will it have in terms of yielding aphids? So I don't know if Reese, do you want to start with that one, and then whether yeah, um, yeah, something else to add into it. I was the drilling. Drilling really starts um, depending on where you are in the country, sort of from from late March through through April, and probably finishes off uh, late April into early May in in, in some regions. Uh, it's more probably more important to drill it into the right conditions. Uh, you know, both both Jim and myself have, have highlighted that early crop development is key, and um, especially from from a virus point of view, that later drilling might might you know might might help from that point of view because you will the crop will develop quicker and it will really it will reach that twelfth leaf stage um, much quicker than if it was if it was drilled early, and uh, you know if it was it was sort of exposed to the wrong conditions early on okay i'd add uh, something there mark um I, I agree with reese on all those points um with regard to the soil temperature uh in in some respects the higher soil temperatures while they're preferable and they speed that early development for for various logistical reasons in some wetter environments they're not always possible and so it um, there's quite a lot of drilling that would happen in New Zealand at lower soil temperatures than that. One of the real issues at the lower soil temperatures is you get staggered germination, which can make your subsequent uh, herbicide use a little tricky. And depending on the cultivars involved, sometimes that uh, earlier sowing will increase the amount of bolters that are, are seen in the crop. So, uh, well, in a few environments, there's some uh, logistical benefits to planting into the lower soil temperatures. You have to recognise that there'll sometimes be some consequences, but realistically, sometimes that's just the cost of doing business. So it is possible to be a little bit more flexible with that and to sow earlier in circumstances where it's likely to suit that. Okay, so just a, just a question on, on nitrogen use. So. Uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, banging urea in the in the UK at the moment. Um, will ammonium nitrate score bleeds? I've uh, I've used ammonium nitrate products at sort of canopy closure and and later on gone with gone with straight nitram later on in the in the season and uh, we haven't experienced uh, vast vast amount of scorch. Okay, and then just. And I yeah, I'd just back that up too. Um, I, I don't think that there's any great difficulties with that. We've certainly not had any experience with tremendous difficulties. And if urea wasn't available, I have no difficulty with the same amount of nitrogen being applied in split applications. No, no difficulty there. And then uh, just leading on again for nitrogen. Um, how much reese in the UK uh, would be allowed to apply? So would we be able to get away with up to that 300 kilograms a hectare that uh, Jim uh, mentioned? Uh, <laughs> theoretically, theoretically, I would say yes, it would be possible. But I think different to New Zealand systems, we probably have 
have more manures from our livestock available. Um, so you, you, you re definitely recommend more, more use of manures. And really something else to consider as well is the potential in the UK. I think really once we get to 200, 240 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, um, honestly, in my opinion, I, I don't believe that we're in, in all regions getting that sunlight and, and daylight hours or, or radiation interception, if you like, um, from our from our crops compared to to New Zealand uh, to, to to reach to reach those massive big big yields that they uh, that they get out there. But I I would be looking at sort of two hundred to two hundred and forty kilos of nitrogen per hectare, um, and and that you know split split timing as well. I'd, I'd add a little bit there, Mark. Um, taking up from recent point, I, I think it's really important to note that the uh, the, the maximum percentage of nitrogen in the crops that will be achieved at the higher end of nitrogen use will be about 2%. So it's worth pointing out that in a 30 tonne crop at 2%, that's 600 kilos of nitrogen. So there's a tremendous draw of nitrogen from the soil and in grazing systems, you know, approximately 75% of that will be recycled. Um, I, I would add the second component to that. If the, if the high no, nitrogen actually, is... I think, um... We've lost Jim there, so we'll just move on to the, to the next question. So does um, nitrogen level affect palatability of the crop? And uh, which, well, I don't know if you're allowed to say this, but which varieties are, are more most palatable? I'm sorry, can, uh, can you hear me okay there? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, you can come back again now, Jim. Yeah, okay, uh, apologies for that. Um, just to, sorry, just to briefly complete uh, what we were saying before with regards to nitrogen, that the, the full benefit of that nitrogen is not uh, used unless you've got, as Reese has pointed out, the heat units to make the most of it, but also the other components of the crop in place. The, the real difference in the crop growth is when you're in that late summer and early autumn period and having good leaf in that period from good husbandry from uh, good disease prevention, et cetera, is really important. So getting those higher end crops um, uh, are really is a matter of doing a lot of small things correctly. And that's probably been the big shift in New Zealand in recent years. But there's no question that at those higher end crops, that higher nitrogen use is effective in raising the content of the bulb and of the leaf, independently of increasing the yields so there are some advantages with it, and I'm, I'm not probably as uh, pessimistic as Reese is that, that lower nitrogen uh, will be the cap. I think uh, the UK has got the environment to grow much bigger crops. Uh, in terms of palatability and um, cultivar, yep, there are differences in cultivars in palatability in general, but it's important to note that um, really good leaf, well-grown crops and really good leaf always increase the palatability of the cultivars for grazing. And that's particularly seen in uh, younger stock. As a knockabout rule of thumb in terms of palatability, uh, the, the deeper varieties into the ground are higher dry matter varieties and typically higher sugar content varieties. And by and large, they're not as palatable as the lower dry matter varieties. But interestingly, it doesn't always follow that way in the ranking. There are some uh, really palatable high dry matter varieties and there's some not so palatable mid dry matter varieties. However, the much more important component of palatability is a well-grown crop. There's no question around that. The better that the crop is grown, the leafier it is, and the higher nitrogen of that crop, the more palatable in general terms it'll be. Okay, so uh, just while we're, we're still on nitrogen, um, I've got one more question here, which is related to more organic systems, but um, is there any way to get late nitrogen on to retain green leaf and organic system, or do you have to just accept a slightly poorer leaf percentage and therefore a lower overall protein? Um, and then also linked to that, um, is Fodby ever grown in no-till, low-till situations successfully? Um, right. Okay. Yeah, I can answer um, them and I'll turn them over to Reese for the UK experience. Um, with regard to the first 
uh, we use effluent dairy effluent sprays and so they're not uh, ordinarily filtered sprays they're just traveling irrigator effluent sprays across the crop well beyond canopy closure in fact we use it throughout uh, all of that summer and early autumn season and that's certainly supplying a lot of nitrogen um, and a lot of potassium obviously and they're a very very effective way of uh, directly uh, applying that nutrient to the crop you also get a reasonable amount of um, fecal fiber onto the leaves uh, when we were first doing that many years ago we felt that that might be associated with more disease but we've never seen that so um, perhaps that's one option in some of the organic systems where they can't apply synthetic uh, chemicals the second one with uh, no-till um, strip not so much no-till but at least strip till uh, has been very popular in New Zealand in certain environments where there's a high wind in particular and one of the difficulties in those environments is you get uh, seedling damage, um, helicoptering where they're pulled out the ground, but also just sandblasting. And strip till, particularly into stubble, uh, has been a really effective way of um, reducing some of that. The, the no-till or direct drill approaches um, have, with no exceptions in New Zealand, always resulted in significant crop yield reductions. So we start at five tonnes reduced and end up sometimes at 10 tonne reduced. But the strip tool is not associated with that. And where there was specific research work I was involved in some years ago, looking at strip till and conventional tillage, it was identical yields. So uh, they can work very effectively, but the direct drilling or no till, not so much. They're only really used in environments where you can't cultivate, for example, very thin topsoil over sand, et cetera. Uh, difficult environments like that, not, not never as, a, as an option. Okay, over to you, Reese. Oh, yeah, I'll just add on to that. On the um, organic nitrogen, um, it would really depend what was available in terms of machinery locally. Um, as, as as Jim suggested, really, there would be no problem in in going on with a with a dribble bar um, with, with you know with livestock slurries uh, late, later on in the season. Um, comment there from Jim as well regarding the min till and the direct drilling where sort of sand blasting or, or soil blow was an issue um, I think in the UK uh, we've we've sort of used barley as, as, as a cover crop um, to re try and retain that that soil and then the barley is, is sprayed sprayed out um, later on using appropriate graminicide okay Right, so um, on to the, the fun topic, really. Um, what is the effect of a high level of infection with virus yellows on, on yield of roots and tops? You'd be looking, well, there's three, three different yellowing viruses that, that affect fodder beet, really. And the one that we see most common is, is the, the mild yellow virus. And you'd be looking really at sort of a you know because of the reduced green leaf area and reduced you know photosynthesis from that plant uh, we, we can see sort of that 15 to 20 percent uh, yield loss um, more beet yellows not the that would um, can can even uh, exceed exceed that loss sort of high, higher losses with with, with that Okay, um, so uh, does fodder beet have a future with ever increasing virus pressure? Uh, yields this year were down as much as 50% in some fields, uh, despite a robust insecticide program. Are there any other techniques to mitigate infection? And then linked into that, um, the other question was just related to drilling date. And I suppose uh, the farmer in question has noticed that there's been, in the later drilled crops, there's been no issues um, at all with aphids or the other viruses. So what are your opinions on that as well? My, my, my experience this year of, of the later drilled, or even, shall we say, later emerged crops, um, where, where they were sown and into that dry period and emergence was delayed, it, it would be uh, it would be true to say that there was less less virus levels in 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 those fields 
Um, I think this year really was extraordinary in terms of the number of aphids early on in the year. We had a very mild winter, uh, which helped the aph aphids survive survive winter and over winter. Um, and sort of the conditions in early spring uh, really really suited them uh, and their and their reproduction. That you know warm warm dry period early on. I think you just, just need experience there that uh, later later sown crops typically hold better leaf uh, into that summer and early autumn period there seems to be some chronology about the timing of foliar disease and in general um, insect damage and uh, subsequent issues as well so what the gentleman has probably picked up on is something that we see um, it it doesn't always translate into a better yield though at least in our experience in New Zealand Okay, um, if field fertilizer recommendations are met, would you still advise tissue sampling, sampling and perhaps applying foliar feed through the leaf? Yes, I think it's something I, I touched upon in, in, the, in the webinar. Um, sort of, you know, what, one interaction to, to really think about is, is that potash and, and magnesium. Magnesium's you know, component of chlorophyll, which is required for of photosynthesis and maintaining that green leaf area. So if there, if there's an imbalance in 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 the in the crop itself, even though even though the soil analysis might show there's enough available, you know, of magnesium there, uh, it might not be available to the crop at the time. So the, those early early leaf tissue analysis through through canopy development are, are crucial really for for tailoring that. That nutritional extra nutritional program that can be uh, can be added into the into the herbicide applications, uh, sort of minimising uh, or offsetting any any deficiencies and and keeping that plant photosynthesising as as effectively as it can, and you know that can only only lead to more yield um, of both both leaf and top really and a healthier and a healthier uh, leaf leaf going into uh, into late summer as well. And I'd, I'd add just one thing there, Mark, and in, in, again from our experience in New Zealand and uh, South America for that matter, that um, the, the reference standards for the tissue concentrations need to be very carefully looked at, uh, particularly in the really high yielding crops. Um, sometimes by the time that that tissue has genuinely declined, you're already too late to intervene. Uh, I mean, that certainly is the case with um, potassium and nitrogen in that late summer and early autumn period you know the, the better crops are achieved when people are proactive and they're continuing to fund that really high dry matter accumulation over that period okay. all right just flicking uh, flicking down to some of the final questions um also uh, while we're on measurements um how can we measure the protein content of, of leaf and bulb well, the, I can probably start with that one. The, the, the best measure of the protein content of the leaf is to dry the entire leaf, not to subsample it. But if it has to be subsampled, it can be cut off, uh, the, the crown removed from the bulb at the level of the lowest green leaf, that crown included in the material, and then the whole uh, piece can be cut in half. But wherever possible, what we do is we dry the entire leaf and then grind and um, subsample that mixed material directly for nitrogen content. So that can be sent off to be done in the laboratory without any difficulty at all. With regard to the nitrogen content of the bulb, one thing that's very important is how you subsample that bulb and what bulbs you use. So there's a variation in the bulb size clearly in the paddock, but uh, some years of research looking directly at this over a, a wide variety of regions and treatments have shown that looking at that bulb size distribution, there's relatively few very small bulbs and relatively few very large bulbs, and quite a lot that are in that median distribution. So we take uh, a couple of median bulbs from that paddock, and then the more important component is how you subsample those bulbs. 
So it's really important that it's subsampled so that you have representative amounts of the top, the bottom, the outside and the inside. And the only way that you can do that effectively is by quartering. In very large bulbs that might end up being putting it into eighths, but it's by quartering them, uh, cutting them longitudinally from the top to the bottom. If you don't do that, then you don't get representative samples. And there is a shift in the content of a lot of nutrient uh, in different parts of the bulb. I say that because in recent times, there's been some talk about coring and coring is an extremely ineffective way of getting dry matter, but also of getting representative samples from the bulb. So having taken a quarter or eighth uh, wedge from uh, a number of bulbs, they can also be sent off to the laboratory and they then can be treated as a whole and subsampled and a really accurate nitrogen content can be obtained from them. Okay, thanks Jim. Um, one of the, the final questions, uh, with the high levels of nitrogen being returned to the soil through animal manures, how is this loss prevented through the winter in high rainfall areas? I can maybe comment a, a little bit on that. Um, in, in terms of nitrogen leaching down through the soil profile, um, be, because that's in part hydrostatic, but also slows down as you move into the warmer and drier weather after that, the, the maximum distances that the nitrate applied in late autumn can move in a year is approximately one metre. Um, certainly in the New Zealand experience, in recent times where we've looked at the root depth uh, recovery of nitrates, the roots can be at 1.5 metres in 70 or 80 days after sowing. And some of the other crops that have been looked at as so-called catch crops after that, oats for example, can also have some relatively deep root. So even though there is quite a lot of nitrogen uh, that can be returned in those grazing environments because of the high stocking rate, the subsequent cropping after that is in a good position to capture and use most of that nitrogen as another capital fertiliser. So in that sense, it can be a positive rather than a negative. Um, I know um, you, you're doing a little bit on carbon footprint in gym. It might be early days, but do you want to say anything about uh, the level of carbon going back into the soils or is that a benefit to the system? Yeah. Well, um, well, one was certainly there's a large interest in uh, carbon sequestration into soils. And uh, what we've been looking at in recent years with some uh, postgraduate students, uh, some of which are finishing right now as well, has been the amount of uh, soil organic matter that can be accumulated in grazing uh, bead in situ. And well, I mean, one of the modeling exercises uh, this year that we've done alongside of the empirical measurements of root depth has been to look at how much organic matter is returned in those cropping systems. Uh, particularly in New Zealand environments, they're often double cropped. And the, we were looking specifically at the very high uh, yielding crops this year. And as a general rule of thumb, if we were looking at crops that were over 40 tonne that were stocked and that were grazed for 70 or 80 days across that winter period, where there was a relatively minor supplement input in the form of baleage, then it's uh, very repeatedly about 20% of the dry matter that's eaten that's returned as species. And then there's an additional urinary component which raises the nitrogen content of that. As a consequence of that, if there's uh, 40 tonnes that uh, has been eaten, plus typically another uh, five or so tonnes of um, supplement that have been put into that system, that means that there's a return of eight or nine tonnes of um, dry matter uh, from the faecal material of the animals back to that hectare. In addition, if there's 80 or 90,000 plants, because it's a very deep rooted plant with roots going down to three metres, if there's 25 grams of dry matter a plant root, and it appears that there's a lot more than that, there's another several tonnes of organic matter that's put uh, through the soil profile right down. And what we modelled in these situations is in, in double cropping circumstances, which are relatively common in the New Zealand experience, there can be up to 26 tonnes of dry matter return to that per hectare. So there's some very positive effects of um, high intensity grazing in beet systems in terms of returning 
soil organic matter and increasing soil organic matter over the short period. And there's more work being done on that now, but it looks very positive. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks very much for, for that reply, Jim. Um, so again, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much for, for joining us tonight. I'd like to say thank you to, to Reese and, and Jim for, for being there uh, and doing the talk tonight. Um, this was the last in the series of, of webinars, um, but hopefully if you've missed one, again, just uh, go back to the AHDB website and you can flip through some of the others. So again, thank you very much for joining and uh, again, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening.